Geometric increase in price performance. We go from cogwheels to electromechanics to tubes to microchips, and it just keeps going. And whether it's war or peace or there's a you know, little economic downturn or the Berlin Wall falls, it all really doesn't matter. It just keeps going and keeps going. So unlike the thing with transport, when one sort of type of technology runs out of steam, there's a new generation that comes along and it just picks up. So we went from cogwheels to electromechanics to tubes to microchips, and probably you know, within 10 or 15 years we're going to do something else. Maybe something with quantum computing, who knows? So all this IT stuff basically is applying our brain to knowledge, which then makes new tools, but actually the tools are new forms of knowledge. And they actually allow our brain to function better because we can access more information, we can display it in all kinds of graphic ways to make it easier for us to understand a very complex data set. So it's becoming a little bit of a feedback loop, which is why we feel all this acceleration and stuff is happening now a lot faster in terms of research and things changing than, say, even 15 years ago, or certainly 50 years ago. So those feedback loops, they're really interesting. Um, so this is some uh, guesstimations on uh, how supercomputers will develop. Um, 2013, we should have a supercomputer that will be able to simulate, uh, fully simulate in real time a human brain. Uh, you know, you might be a bit off, say, a factor of 10, but of course, since it's doubling every 1.2 years, that doesn't really impact the end result by much. Um, of course, Rana, people say that we have, uh, we'll have a, a computer as smart as a, a human being sort of before 2020, and then, of course, a computer smarter than all of us put together by 2050, but there's a whole bunch of assumptions built into that. Um, computers are getting good at a whole bunch of stuff, though. For instance, predicting who's, you know, what team is going to win, which is normally, of course, done by sort of, you know, moustached gentlemen smoking cigars on some Dutch... Um, television programs, and they really suck at actually predicting it correctly. Computers can do it quite well because they can hold the entirety of all available statistical information you know, in their memory and then apply it. This is also things that computers can do now, right, sort of, well, maybe it's not literature, but it is certainly, it's, it's a story. This is a very short part of a novella written by a machine, and the machine had uh, practiced on 100,000 uh, other English uh, novel texts, and from that created you know, software, its own software, uh, based on the patterns in those texts to create new texts. So now you can just give it a bunch of variables and it'll spit out a novella. Now, it's maybe not yet the Nobel Prize in literature, but it's, you know, certainly better text than most people can write on the planet, given that most people can't write yet. So we have cars that can drive themselves. That is pretty cool. Um, this is a really hard problem because visual information processing is really hard for machines, but we've cracked that pretty much. Volkswagen uh, is one of the big sponsors next to, of course, DARPA, uh, the, the Pentagon Research Tank, because Volkswagen thinks that, you know, in 15 years or so, they'll probably sell us a car not just with satellite navigation system, but with an autopilot. Now, what happens then will be very interesting, because, of course, what we'll probably see is that when you let the machine drive, it'll have less accidents after, you know, when we get the bugs out. Um, because 90% of all accidents are, of course, caused by humans, which tend to do very stupid things, and they get distracted and angry and sad and all those kinds of things. So then what's going to happen is that insurance uh, companies are going to say, look, we'll have two sorts of premiums. One set for people who have a car and let the car drive. We'll have another, and it's like six euros a month. And then there's another set of people who, you know, for some archaic reason, want to do the steering themselves. It's like 300 euros a month. Because we all know that you know, if you let people handle the buttons, shit happens. Now, Japan is doing other stuff, like uh, building these robots. They've been working for uh, 20 years, but it can now do simple things like you know, pass out drinks and distribute medicine in the hospital and things like that. It can also conduct the Chicago Symphonic Orchestra, which apparently isn't that hard. Um, it's supposed to have the IQ of a one-year-old, so that tells you something about that job. This is the latest generation of that robot, and it's really beginning to sort of come together. Um, so this is the... Um, the nurse of the future in Japan, who's going to take care of all the 90-year-old Japanese people. And, of course, Japanese robots to feed you sushi, which is also very useful. Um, so Japan is really, really had. Meanwhile, of course, the Americans are building robots to kill people. <laughs> so, I don't know. I, I, I guess in some sick way, this, in theory, might have its use, but... Only, you know, if you already accept that bad stuff happens in the world. So this was an interesting PhD uh, 
program uh, two years ago at the University of Maastricht, somebody actually was given four years of time to think about the social relationships we have with our robots. I mean, it's like a dream PhD thing. And um, so this is one of the things he, he came up with. It was fun. He actually researched, um, for instance, uh, people who have Roomba vacuum cleaners, what kind of relationship they have with their Roomba. Because, of course, an ordinary vacuum cleaner is just something you use, and you hate it, and then you put it away. The Roomba vacuum cleaners are more treated like pets. They are given names. Um, there are online shops where you can actually buy clothes for them. And, and they go like crazy. Um, they are taken you know, with the family on holiday and to friends and things like that. So a Roomba vacuum cleaner, which isn't really intelligent at all, it's you know, smart enough not to bump into your table, um, but it's treated like a pet. And it often becomes good friends with the cats, and then the cats can Roomba surf, and you might have seen that on YouTube and stuff like that. It's really cool. So basically the idea is, well, you know, push that a little further. If the machines get smarter and smarter, then you know, we might end up with this sort of situation which is, of course, very funny again until you look at photos from Japan where they're already sort of almost there. This is a robot walking, talking, and you know, I'm sure she could maybe do some other things. I don't know about that. You'd have to ask that guy. So now, that all, of course, sounds really, really funny. I mean, who could think of that? I mean, you know, a couple consisting of a machine and a human. That's unthinkable. Well, maybe unthinkable just means that it's hard to think about because... The kind of giggling that you hear now in the room is pretty much the same kind of giggling you would have heard 200 years ago when we still had slavery in the Netherlands and we're making a tidy profit out of it. You would, you know, if you would have said, well, we're going to have multiracial couples one day and it's going to be normal. You know, they're going to be accepted by society. People would have thought you were crazy. So with robots, things get even more funnier because, of course, now it's our tools who can potentially create new knowledge, which then used to create new tools, which then create new knowledge. And now we've really closed the loop to a level where actually the humans aren't even part of the loop anymore. And, of course, you know, those pesky humans, they always are slow, they get tired, they need to sleep and all that kind of crap. So that if that's not necessary anymore, you close the loop. And, of course, the engineers are machines that are becoming twice as fast in whatever they do every 18 months. Then we get some real acceleration. But of course, some other stuff is going to happen as well. So I want to give a few more examples of that. Um, let's see if we get some. Yeah, here we go. So some biotechnology stuff, which you can just read in general sort of science news. Um, 200 meters track running. Paralympics record is now 21.58 seconds by a guy who is technically an invalid, which you know, implies that he's a you know, kind of sad person that we have to take care of. I don't know about you, but I can do 200 meters in 21 uh, 0.5a, but he can. And uh, he wanted to do, go to Beijing last year to the Olympics, but they wouldn't let him, and it was a, all a bit of a legal mess because, of course, on the one hand, they said, no, no, you're an invalid, and so you need to go to um, at the Paralympics. But on the other hand, there were some emails leaked that people were actually afraid that he might actually win because he has these state-of-the-art legs which get improved every couple of months, and he actually might outrun some human athletes. Um, I think um, in 2012 in London, he could uh, get some, uh, uh, some prizes. Um, we can now make custom, a custom genetic mouse uh, for research for $250 a pop. What that means is, um, say you're doing research to a specific type of cancer, you can then figure out um, the, kinds of, um, the kinds of genes that you would want in a mouse to make sure the mouse has that type of cancer so you can test your therapy on it. And you don't want one mouse, but you want a thousand divvied up into two groups, the control group and the actual group. So you want a thousand mice who are genetically identical with a set of genes that you want to program. So you 